Hi, Ray, how are you doing? Hi. Hi, Kevin. I hope you're good. Good, it's a little hectic around here, but I, I did manage to get the video prepared and it's uploading to YouTube. I'll uh, link you to you and Angela and Joe it afterward. Oh, for your internship. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you can also put it on your Google Drive and share it from your Google Drive because sometimes. Oh, I thought you guys you, wanted it on YouTube. <laughs> if you don't want it to be viewed by public on YouTube, you can choose unlist on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that way, that way, not a lot of people, if you, unless, unless you wanted to set it up for public, but okay. Thank you for that. I mm -hmm. just, I wanted to wrap up your file and Chris's file. And then um, I'm getting ready for the business intern to start. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of intense. How's that been looking? Well, you know, <clears throat> usual with the CCC people, with the foundation, it's the same <laughs> deal. Like they just sit on stuff and, you know, I'm waiting for background on some of them and it's been like a couple of weeks. So I got to nudge them again. But this mm. is my last round with Cascade. Um, they have another one that's going to be with Cadence, um, but it's more like... Um, manufacturing cybersecurity stuff, mm -hmm. which I opt out on because I have a lot on my plate right now. So no, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Especially I, with this class and the GNS stuff messing up and not needing to find a new avenue. Well, yeah, I still have to work on some call stuff for you guys, but I want to share with you something. Hold on. Let me pull up a, an email from my supervisor. She, there's a, a competition for bug bounty stuff. Uh, for student and it requires programming and it will be perfect for this class but give me a second oh, let me cool. pull up melody Gravine okay email i'll drop the link in the chat for everybody to see so if you want to participate um it's good because a lot of the employers um are looking for employees through the competition so let's see yeah, we had to, um, for like COM9, we had to upload things to YouTube. So I created a school account, just do everything unlisted. So that's where I put it and I'll, I'll be able to bounce it to you after it gets uh, prepared and set. Okay, thank <clears throat> you. So there is a competition for, uh, it's called Supply Change Challenge with Cybersecurity. It's mm -hmm. happening on March 20th. And you can win up to twenty five hundred dollars. Um, wow. It's it's a programming capture the flag kind of environment, so it's a little bit different than the NCL. Um, this one requires programming. So let's see. It's happening. It starts at nine a.m. Eastern Standard and it ends at three p.m. Eastern Standard on March twentieth. So you're looking at um, a Saturday. And it, this is open in the US or Canada. Let me get the link for you. That's during my computer lab hours. <laughs> well, it's open to everybody. So for the rest of the class, if you're interested. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, if no um, one comes in, I could I could check it out. But yeah. Sorry for the long. That's the link that I Whoa. got from the button. <laughs> so um, if you wanted to RSVP, you're welcome to do that. And um, let me share screen. I, I only receive it in email, so I don't have it as, um, I don't have it as, it didn't, it wasn't sent to me, it was sent to the dean, so. Mm. All right, so let me touch on a little bit on the technical qualification in that. Well, I'm just so super uncoordinated today, and then I got to fire up my virtual machine to show you guys how to. Okay, so um, just a little bit for the competition. Uh, let me minimize everybody. So you can win $2,500 in cash and there are other prices. Um, you can, you will be competing in teams. So maybe if you talk to your classmates, if you're interested in this, um, this is open to North America and 
this is for supply chain. There's a huge demand for cybersecurity in this area because a lot of people can manage uh, network defense stuff, but they are unable to solve some of the IoT and the security areas for supply chain people. Um, and so it says that uh, experience real life security issues with finding bugs in websites, reverse engineering applications and hacking problems. Test your skills and challenge yourself. Participants need to be at, le at least have to have a basic understanding of how computer programs work. If you are in computer science program or you are of computer programming knowledge, this is the event for you. So what I'll do is I'll try to repost this in the announcement later, but um, if you just join us, right? If you don't see the link, let me know. I will give you the link uh, at the end of our session. So this is open to you if you're interested. And it's a good opportunity to, if you wanted to go into the programming side of cybersecurity, this is the area that many of you might be interested in. So um, I will share it with all my classes. Um, and so in case anybody wants to. And then uh, if you are free this Saturday, um, you can support us. Uh, Michelle and some of the other students are competing in the Mayor's Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the California Mayor's Cup, and I will provide you with the link later on. Um, I'm presenting on Thursday, Life After Five. One of my former students is now an engineer at Eastern Water Municipal District uh, Office. And so he will be presenting on certifications and his journey to uh, get where he is. It's been five years since he's taken classes with me. Uh, so, you know, he's now very successful. He also uh, teach or train classes through UCR Extension. He competes in blue and purple team uh, for cybersecurity. I have some other students that are on red team as well, but they were not available to, to talk. So um, if you like to attend the event, um, I will share that information with you in announcement after, after our class today. I have a little bit of time to drop this in. So I'll share this along with the Mayor's Cup. And if you want to support your classmates, if you wanted to go and watch. So every day from today or yesterday until uh, Thursday after 5 p.m. to 7 or 6.30 is when different schools and different professionals, different companies present. Um, we got quite a few people from big organization that, that, um, that will be there to present, you know, various things, including jobs. So um, as you know, that 3.5 million jobs are available globally for cybersecurity. There's not enough people in it. So if you're thinking about certifications and things like that, now is the time. And I will talk about certification next week. It's open to you uh, for the programming side and the regular IT side. That's free this year. Okay, so, all right. Um, let's touch on our lab today. That's what we wanted to address. So um, as you are finishing up last week's lab, I received quite a few emails, uh, some concerns about GSN3. And as I mentioned to you last time that um, if you don't get GSN3 set up, no big deal, okay? Um, I don't want you to stress over it. It's one of those tools that, you know, if you don't have the RAM or the processor for it, it's fine. I just want you to look at the example program. So I reposted the example program and then look at the question I'm asking and then, you know, edit the program and make it where, you know, if you have a, a, a Nessus switch, it would work. And um, if you have the book, you can take a look at the sample code on his GitHub. I think he released everything on his GitHub. Um, and you can download some of the programs that would be used for the textbook there. So um, with that said, if you are still working on lab three, that's okay. Um, yeah, so Seth asked if you need the book, if you need the book, I guess you have access to that. So if, um, for, for if you're wrapping up lab three, it's okay if you submit it late, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna penalize you. I have, I've been pretty lenient 
in the last few weeks because I know people are still adding the classes um, or they're trying to catch up and it's been there been a lot of stuff going on so I understand yeah if you have any questions please reach out to me and let me know um, whatever I can do to help you I would um, so for this lab this lab we are going to use the virtual machine but the good news is yeah, welcome. So the good news is that if you have Mac OS, you don't have to worry about the virtual machine for this lab. You can run Ansible directly on it That's the, if that's what you want. But if you wanted to use Ubuntu so you can have, or you know, a Linux virtual machine, you're welcome to do that, okay? So I know that some of you are using Mac OS. So I dug a little bit um, when I, I revised this lab throughout this, last few days and I, I just wanted to make sure I cover you know all areas and um, so we are working with Ansible and we talked about Ansible as a framework and IT people and security people use Ansible quite a bit it, it helps in you know automating a lot of things so you're going to see that we're going to do um, we're going to set it up from the beginning to the end Right, I, I created the instructions on how you would go from the beginning to the end. And then by the end, um, you know, I provided some of the playbook information so you can set it up where it will create text files for you. And text files can be a lot of things. It can have a list of your devices. It can, you know, you can generate text files for many, many different things. It doesn't have to be text, it could be other files. So Ansible, is often used for reconfigurations um, or doing maintenance in, in the network environment. Um, but on the side of administration, outside of just networking, you see it used for web servers, you see it used for database. Um, there's so many different uh, available examples that you can examine. And there are tons of playbooks that already created. So if you need something, you can go to the documentation and there are people who release GitHub repo um, that they created different playbooks throughout their time as administrator or, you know, technician or, you know, uh, professional in the field. So you should be able to find a lot of resources on it. Um, and, you know, if you choose to use other framework like Puppet and things like that, those are also common as well. So with that said, um, we will be utilizing, I will be utilizing the virtual machine to demo to you. But if you use Mac OS, you need to have Brew to do the terminal installation. And um, I think I touched on Brew a little bit in my other classes, but so this is kind of like your pseudo app get install in Linux, right? So it needs that or pip it needs that to kind of install the packages. So basically this is a module and this module allows us to create playbook that automate all kinds of different tasks. Um, so it is mostly compatible with Linux and since Mac OS is, you know, it originated with Unix. So they support Ansible with that, okay? So to install on the Mac OS, I put the note there. Um, and with the Windows, there are some stuff that's that's coming up that's available to Windows. But I, I think in the documentation, they mentioned that it's not fully supported. So you can find some information, but it will work with Windows Shell for the target system as we talked about that in the lecture. So to install Ansible, um, we will use Unix-based system. And uh, for the lab, if you created a virtual machine for lab two, you can revisit it and use it. If you have a Linux uh, system at home, that will be great. You can test, you can run it on there so that way you don't have to build a virtual machine. And I link it to where, how you can install and this goes to the documentation of Ansible. So um, with that, let me open up my virtual box. And I'm gonna start my Ubuntu. I already imported these in. Um, so 
That's why they're on the list. So if you don't have your virtual machine imported into VirtualBox, once you create it, you have to import it in. Now, I, I'm, I heard that, you know, if you, if you use like Mint or other releases, right? Uh, there's installation process in, in that you have to set up partition sometimes. And uh, like in Fedora, Fedora requires like setting up swap and things like that. Um, and once you download the ISO, you have to use like a, a, an image creator like Rufus in order to make it. And you can simply put it on a USB and then you just mount that USB to create your virtual machine. Um, so I, I play with virtual machines sometimes when I have time and just kind of see what kind of tools that they would be. But um, for Debian base, like if you're using Kali Linux and things like that, please look at Ansible documentation and it tells you the actual command that you would use for different versions of Linux um, that would be compatible with the, the actual module. Okay, so I'm going to log in. All right, so let's, while it's, it's slowly booting, right? Um, well, let's talk about the, the steps. So what I did was I sectioned this to show you like what you're doing in that section. Um, and I'm hoping with, with this presentation or, or in this part of the lab, when I demonstrate it, I can explain to you a little bit further on what, um, hi Patrick what, uh, how that step is, would be, okay? All right, so we are mainly gonna use the terminal. And in the terminal, what you will need to do is you have to go through these steps um, as the, the notes and the textbook talks about. Um, and I, you know, I, I double check the command with Ubuntu. So if you're using, like I said, other Linux, please look at their documentation. So for the Ubuntu, um, to open up terminal, you can, if it's not seen here, you can simply go show all, all application and the recent application stuff, it will be here, but if you can't find it there, you just search for terminal and then open that up. Okay. And, um, now, depending on the resolution uh, of your video configuration, so if you're creating your virtual machine, you see it kind of small like this, it's because of the video configuration um, that will be allocated for that virtual machine. So let me see if I can get my, my thing to... Okay, well, it is what it is. I will change the preference later. Okay, so um, what we need to do is we first need to update, right? So we, we simply, we would do a super user do apt update. And what that will do is it will bring your operating system, the Ubuntu virtual machine up to date. So, And it would likely ask you for the authentication again. And then once you um, input that in, it's gonna go through and, uh, and do the update depending on you know connection and all of that, but usually it's fairly fast. So this process will take a few minutes. Um, and so for, <clears throat> After the update is finished, then you are going to install the pop, the software, the common properties for the software. And this is required for Ansible. Then um, you are going to add the repo with the PPA. Now, when you read the documentation, it tells you to type in like, you know, dash you. It, it is a little bit confusing with the step. So what I did was I revert back and in the textbook, that's more of a consistent step. And so when I tested these, they work. Um, so at this point, what you're gonna do after you install the software property 
um, then you're going to add the repository. And then after that, you will do the installation. And out of this, this will take, I don't know, 15 minutes at the most, depending on if you have issues with your syntax or not, et cetera. But um, when I tested it with Ubuntu, it worked. So once we have that, we would do the installation. Um, and then you just see the installation. Now, what you can do is if it's already installed, because you had checked out the lab. I'm sorry that Word um, changed my dash is there, but you need to do any type of application that you install. Like in most command line, you can do a dash, the option B or the version, and it will tell you. Um, I do this with my Java class. And in the past, we saw this with Python and CIS 30A already, right? We can open, we can do the pip install in Windows, and then we just check the version. So it's good to, when you haven't used the application for a while, you can, you can find out. And some Linux uh, release actually have some of the tools that's already equipped. So, and it might be outdated, so it might just push an update um, in such case. So since I installed it, I'm just going to skip the other two steps for the sake of time. OK. Um, then it's going to try to find the version. And what we want, and it changes usually pretty frequent, right, depending on how often they update this. Um, so in the text, since that text was written a year ago, uh, we find that it mentioned that you want to use 2.8.x, but the current version that you would see is like 3.9 point something, okay? Or later on, if you use it, it might be a later version. So after you get your Ansible installed, I need you to take a screenshot of the version that you installed, okay? So that way I know that you successfully install it on your system, okay? So if you have a 2.9 point something, that's okay. We wanted to use 2.8 or later, okay? Um, then this is just a step that was previously explained in the lab where we use pexpect from lab two. Um, but if you didn't generate your RSA key, and I found that uh, sometimes when I'm looping, I'm testing to loop the system, which I which is what we're doing. We're using the same virtual machine and we treat it as the server and the client all together. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it you you might have to re regenerate and recopy the key. But this step right here allows you to set up your SSH key. Um, and some of you have done this for your Raspberry Pi. Once you generated that key, keep in mind that, remember how when we did pexpect, pexpect allow us to what to fill in the information for that process. But once you generated the key and copy that key already, it already exists. And it, every time that you need to connect to another system using SSH, it would refer to that key for that, for the Linux machine or the machine that you're using. Um, so here, if you already did the key generation and copy the key from lab two, um, you know, you can check to, um, then what you can do is you don't have to do step number two, but if you didn't, right, I always just go back and check. So we wanted to, and so later on, if you run into issues, like it's not able to show something, it's because it's not able to SSH. And you can test it by SSHing to that, that same machine that you're using. Um, and if it's successful, right, then we, it should be able to connect you to the terminal of that machine at least, or the interface. Okay, so what it will do is, we want to, you can keep the default where the key is, is stored. And right here, when you're using a cat, cat stands for concatenation in Linux. 
And what that will do is in the case where if you wanted to look at a file or a system or a container, you can cat that particular container. And what that will do is it's gonna show you the content of it. List is different where we would be using LS to list like, you know, uh, files and subdirectories and things like that. So in the case where if it's buried inside directories, you can do an LS to list to find out the path um, or what, what content, what kind of files and folders is in that container. But with the cat, what that will do is it's going to allow us to be able to put that on the rsia.pub. And um, you, when you press enter, it just automatically save that name once you generated the key as the default name. But if you give it a name, like if you give it like key A or something like that, then um, it would, you have to type that in. Okay, so in the process here where I, the step B for two, if I, I say press enter, all that is is just saves the default key name <coughs> to the .ssh subdirectory. And what we're doing with that is we're gonna take that file and we're gonna copy it, right? We're gonna publish it um, to a, 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 different, a different folder or a different file, right? So that way Ansible can use it to <clears throat> be able to, you know, set up the, when we run the playbook, when we need to, you know, attach or get into a target system, we're able to SSH into the target system uh, in the automation process. So this is an important step and you have to know that Ansible uses SSH now before some of the older module would, would allow you to use Telnet, but the industry does not use Telnet anymore. Okay, so it uses port 22. Okay, any question with this? Okay, so to really break it down on what we will be doing is after you first you install Ansible, second you got to make sure you copy your SSH key, third you need to create inventory file. Now in this particular lab you're not doing much with Python, okay, you basically use a module that's written in Python and you would use it in your command or in your command line or your terminal to be able to automate task. Okay. So now can you write a program that would incorporate this module and do additional things? Sure. Um, if you go further and look at the documentation, they have set up where, you know, specific type of systems, um, you know, things like that, uh, or uh, in for the cloud environment, how you would be able to work with some of the, um, the Docker uh, for the cloud um, using Ansible. Okay, so this is helpful as well now that we are automating a lot of stuff with the infrastructure in the cloud. So in the future, you will likely have to reference that um, as many companies are using cloud, okay? So just keep in mind that we're not doing much with the script with Python, we're basically setting up files and playbook to use a Python module. Okay, all right. So after you have copied the key, then what you're gonna do next is you are going to create an inventory file. And all this is, is a configuration file, right? OS uses .ini. <clears throat> I don't know if, if, if you guys are versed with like, like, you know, operating system and, and, and that type of environment, but um, in the legacy operating system, many, uh, almost all the operating system would revert to INI file for boot for a lot of things. So if you look at like a Windows OS, if you trying to look at some of the system file, you would likely see dot INI. So, this type of file, you know, as mentioned in the notes, that we would use it for to tell the machine, right, that this is the configuration of our system. And in the network environment, all that is is what 
a domain or an IP address, okay? Because that is something that we already configured for that machine, that, that controller. Um, and if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to connect to a group of computers, let's say that you, your task is to install an application on a part of the network on a subnet, okay? Then what you can do is you will make an inventory file and in that inventory file, you would have a group name and you would have a list of IP addresses for those systems, okay? And then you would also have on that list adjacent to the IP address, you would have, you know, how the user would authenticate. But at that point in your configuration file, you would call on the method that is written in the Ansible module, okay? So it's, what we're doing is we are implementing, the, we're pulling some of the functions that are, were written in Ansible to be able to automate the task. So for example, like connection, right? We would tell it what kind of connection that would be. And they already wrote that function for the connection. Um, based and, and it's part of a class, right? So if you're looking at module, like Ansible module, well, you will be able to find that section. And in that section, they have specified on how the connection would be. Or we can say Ansible, you know, login or account. And that would allow, you know, it to connect, then authenticate, okay? So in a configuration file, we wanted to put in our, our configuration information for our destination or our target system. And usually we can use an IP address unless you work with web servers, then you would put in your domain information. So if it's a child, then you would put in the, the fully qualified name for the dom that particular web server or database server, et cetera. Okay, so this is basically just a configuration list. That's all it is, okay? So your inventory file needs to be created. Now I use VI editor. You are welcome to use Nano, right? And all you're doing is you're using a text editor to create a host, um, a host file. So I'm gonna show you that, okay? And um, you wanted to put it in the folder where Ansible configuration module, after you install it, what happens is the system is gonna put it in to the, the folder etc and then Ansible. Your host file or your, your inventory file has to be together with where the Ansible application exists, right? That does, does that make sense? Unless you set up your system variable path. Um, now to avoid all the additional step, all we're doing here is we are creating a, a, an inventory file in the Ansible subfolder, right? That's where Ansible is installed. So that way we can run, we can run um, the playbook and it's gonna refer to the configuration file for all the target system information, okay? So now if you didn't install VI editor, then you need to install it. It's gonna prompt you that. It's gonna tell you do sudo install, sudo app install, et cetera. So put that in if you didn't have VI editor, but if you wanna use nano. Now um, for the playbook and then inventory, I suggest Right. If you're using an IDE, they mentioned it for the playbook because it uses YAML, it's better to write it in an IDE and then save it to this, this folder because <clears throat> it helps you with the syntax. The IDE would catch, right? Some of it highlights some of the things. So indentation and white spacing is important in YAML. So later on, you would see. Um, that we would use VI editor again, but you're welcome to use IDE uh, editor to write it, okay? So 
Um, I wrote it already. So I'm going to just show you that because I'm not the fastest typer in the world. All right. So yes, question. So do we have to, um, the uh, Linux takes the INI file. Well, it's, um, I guess we have to make that folder the mm -hmm. um okay but if, when you in, if you install it on mac os um navigate to the folder where ansible exists so you have to search for it um there i think there's some information online i didn't look into it a little bit further because i got a little tired but um i'm pretty sure that you can find the actual path on the mac os because once you install it it creates that folder already um, but, you know, people say that if you wanted to make a folder and then put all your files in there and then transfer it later, you can. I hope that helps. All right. So um, now when you create the file, let me see, let me see. I might have to do sudo because I'm on as a... And So it might ask, oh. oh, see that? Pseudo vim, sorry. <laughs> My brain is not functioning this morning or afternoon. What's that? I know. There you go. <laughs> Takes forever. Okay, so what it's bringing me is it's telling me that I have like a, a host file and then I have a host the INI file, right? And then I can vim into it. Um, so in, in this particular folder, I have like these, okay, these files. So on the host INI, what you can do is you can simply, let me quit it real quick, okay. So to quit, you do a colon Q, or if you want to right quit, colon W Q. But if you wanted to edit the file, you have to press the insert key or the I on your keyboard, okay? If you're using Vim, why is it not? Let me, let me restart it, sorry. Let's open another one. Okay, so I'll show you what that looks like. Um, I, I wrote one in the home, so. Vim host. Okay, so for the sake of illustration, so you need to put it in that folder, okay? Um, now, if you're running everything from the home, um, when you write your playbook, you're going to have a little bit of a trouble. It's not going to be able to find your INI file. Uh, so it's going to kind of throw an error. Um, so that's why it's important to make sure that you put it in that path. But anyway, earlier I mentioned that if you, um, if you want to, let me see if I can zoom in. There we go. Come on, more. All right, if you wanted to make a group of systems, like a target system, you can simply use the, the list like this, right? And in, in Python, we know that when we're using the square brace, it's a list. So we establish a list and you give it a name. Um, now, for the sake of exercise, instead of firing up like two, three different virtual machines, which you can, that will be great but I'm not requiring that. So in the case that if we have other systems, right, um, the, the least that you can do 
would be having the IP address, right? Or the domain information. You can also use your host name um, or domain information. And when you use Ansible connection like this equal local, what you're telling it is that it's, this is a local system, it is itself. And if you're familiar with networking, this is a loopback address, okay? 127.0.0.1 calls home. Um, I actually have a shirt that says that. Um, what does that mean? It is calling itself, it's connecting to itself. So they designed it in a way where, you know, we can ping that same system that, that we're using. Um, and so every system would have some kind of loopback address. So we're using a, a version four here, but what we're doing is we are going to connect to our own local system that we're using. We're, we're actually connecting to the virtual machine that we're using. Now, in the case where you have other hosts, right, like your target host, let's say a switch or a router or a server, um, you know, et cetera, you would list them here. And then in addition to this, you can tab it and then add in additional. So when you're looking at example online, they actually have, or the even in the book, they have it where it would be specifying like, you know, how the, the, the system would be authenticating <coughs> and then the connection, the domain information. So this is part of the configuration file or what we call an inventory file for Ansible. Okay, so it's going to refer to this to establish connection. Okay, now the challenge with using the local system in that, um, in when you write it like this and you give it a list name like this, it's not going to like it because the way that they wrote Ansible is that any time that you deal with the local host, it's under a, it's under a, a super group called all, okay? And with that, it's going to refer to that group for any local system, any, you know, to itself. So when you call it in playbook and you're trying to use a uh, a name like this, okay, it's not going to like it. So I just want you to know that. So if you give it a group label and if you list one of the local system, right, it's going to have a, it's going to have a little bit of an issue. So later on, when we look at the playbook, we would refer to that as all because we're using our own system to kind of automate things. Okay. But the point in Ansible is to automate other systems, right? Not just our own system. It kind of defeat the purpose. Okay. So uh, yeah. What? So what do you mean? Like, if it doesn't like it, then what happens? Well, it's then you have to remove the group name. If you're using any time that you're using local, okay. I'm gonna go into edit real quick. Okay. Um then what you need to do is you need to take this thing out like this okay so that's why when i have you write it i didn't you don't have to put a group name on there but if you're using like other system that you're connecting to like a switch a router a server etc you would list them here and then you can give them a group name okay so normally they would do this they would say um let's say that i have two subnet right i can have I can say sub one or sub, right, A, like this. And then I would put 192.168.0. Let's say four. Okay. And then I would say Ansible, right, connection equal SSH, like that. And then with SSH, you got to give it um, some kind of account information, right? Like what kind of user account that you're using okay so in, in addition to that you would have you know ansible username equal something okay so and and so on right so we can have that one subnet and we can say 192.168.0.5 and then so on and then you know or in other case we can say um, this might be for our web server, web, right? 
and then we would say that this might be for uh, so we would say the, the machine name so we can say child one oops at domain.com and then how you connect to it equal SSH it's always going to be SSH with Ansible and then the account that you would use to administer that, right? Because it's going to plug that in at, in that process. Uh, so you're saying that just for this homework assignment, we need to connect to the local, but in not outside of this homework assignment, we wouldn't have to connect to local because we didn't have a reason. Right. So following the steps that I wrote, I wrote it for just, the local system itself right it's connecting to itself and it's going to automate some of the things but if you wanted to test it you know like i mentioned in the lecture if you have like two raspberry pi that you wanted to connect set that up right put in the raspberry pi address okay and then your connection will be ssh right and then think about the process in when it connects and what you want to do in that raspberry pi so let's say that if I wanted to update the Raspberry Pi, then I just need for it to do what? I just need to, to configure, this is for configuration. I tell it the IP address of the Raspberry Pi, how it connects to the Raspberry Pi and what user account it's gonna use to log in to for that SSH session. And then after that you're done, you would save this host file. And then when you write your playbook, you're going to point to that host file. So, and in your playbook, you would say, uh, you know, do sudo app get update on the Raspberry Pi. Okay. But for the lab, yes, to answer your question, you don't have to simulate multiple virtual machines. But if you desire to do so, you can. Any question? So when you're done, right, after I inserted all the, th the content of my, my, my uh, inventory file, I should refer to the right name, which has the configuration of the target system, how it would connect, how it would communicate, then I can just do, I will press escape on my keyboard to get out of VI editor here, the, the edit, the insert mode, and then I simply do a colon right quit okay and keep in mind that my my host file is incomplete right i still have more stuff to add but i want to show you how that would be okay and press enter and you're back to your you're back to your um terminal all right so we touch on oops sorry that was my cybersecurity ADT <laughs> that I'm working on. Okay, so here is, yes. If I try to save the host any file and I get uh, permission denied, how do I, what's the goal uh, for that? Uh, so so are, you log on as a non-super user. Are you sudo in? Um, I, Oh, is that is, okay? I'm not. I guess I'm. I don't know. Yeah. Have, so yeah. anytime that you create a user account on a Linux machine, or if you're using like Mac OS, likely that you're not a super user or an administrator, right? Like root. Um. So for Linux, you would need to do a super user do right. It's but it's still going to ask you for the password every time to make sure that you know, you're able, and for you know, installation, stuff like that. So if it's telling you that permission is denied, when you're connecting with SSH, so let's say that you, you, if you're saving the file itself and it, 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 if permission is denied, it's because you don't have the permission for, it's the read-only folder. And to avoid the read-only folder, you have to be a, a, a super user to do that. Because okay. I thought it was might have been something else. Because uh, I, I can't remember with so many um, so many virtual machines. I, I, <laughs> yeah. So you have to do a super user do. And if you just do vim, or you know, if you just go to the if you cd to the directory and try to write the file, 
what will happen is going to say it cannot save the file. Okay. Um, because like what Michelle is asking is this. Okay, so let's say that this is my, this is my, um, this is my path is home. Okay, so I'm gonna put put pull this up so you can see. Let's say that I need to navigate to my folder, right? The etc and Ansible. Okay, so let me see under. Then you would. If you go through the interface, this is what happens. You go to the computer and then you go to ETC and then you go to Ansible, right? After it's installed, right? It's supposed to be here, okay? So what would, see how these files that I wrote, they're here, okay? And the playbook is here. You wanna put them here because this is where the Ansible config file is at and they work together, okay? So they have to be together. Now, um, if, you, if, if you just navigate and then you try to make a file here, this is a read-only folder at the user level, right? For, because you are a user account in the system that you logged on. For example, I am KN. It's not going to let me write manually like this. We have to use the command line and we would say, no, I'm a super user and I'm gonna write the configuration file here, okay? So if you try to do the terminal and you try to CD in and, and create the, the and Vim, right? The, the INI file, it's gonna deny because it, it sees that you don't have the permission to write additional file to it. So you have to do a sudo, okay? Other questions? Okay, so coming back here. Um, so after, after we have set that up, then what you're doing with the ping command here is that when you're, when you're, when we would try to connect to the SSH using SSH inventory file, when, when you're testing the ping, all that is is so the ping module allows you to ping other system, right? That's, that's we talked about this last time and also week one. What you're doing is, let's say that if your job is to check to make sure that all the systems, all the servers are, 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 are communicating are on, right? And they could be remote. They don't have to be physically at your, at your company. Um, so what you can do is you can use Ansible and create an inventory file and ping them all at once, okay? So what this will do is the dash M here is for the module and to ping, okay? So when, after you created the INI, then what you're gonna do is you are going to use the terminal and then you would do an Ansible 127.0.0.1, you're pinging your own local system. Of course, I can ping my own local system. The reason why I put it in here so that way you know it's already connected, we, we might as well test with it, right? Uh, but if you wanted to, if you set up your configuration file or your inventory file for other hosts, then you would put in the IP address that you want, okay? But instead of doing one by one, which is not the whole point, you can ping the whole group, okay? So if you put a label of the group, it would let you ping, okay? So we can send out ping and then it will ping like a hundred servers for us. And then you would get like green response. So when it gives you the red response back, what will happen is that means that something is weird, something is funky with your, with your inventory file and it's not working right, okay? So we would do an Ansible, right? And then for this, we would do an IP address dash M ping.
And on my machine, I actually changed my IP. So you should get something like this, right? And you get the Linux joke, ping pong. <laughs> so a lot of stuff is hidden in Linux and it's interesting. So here, uh, you get a success, right? And then that means that it, it responded. Okay, so when you run your playbook for, let's say we have a hundred server, like what we talked about, you're gonna see a bunch of those showing up that it, you know each of the addresses is gonna be successful based on your, your host. Okay, so it's gonna use those address that's listed in the host INI. Okay, any question? Or if it's doing, if it's timing out, um, it, or it doesn't have the proper connection, you might see either red or some purple messages. It will say that it cannot access the host or something like that. Um, then in that case, go back, look at your, your inventory file and then see if there's something that's not supposed to be there or something's wrong. And then also go back and look at your playbook to see if, you know, if you set your, up your playbook, which we will talk about next. Question. All right, so you saw how that is. So first we would test it with the local host um, and then we would do an option I, so you would get a little bit more details. And then um, next, right, you can add a variable to the host, okay? So when we add the variable, you saw earlier, I have it, it would be Ansible connection is local, okay? So what it's gonna do is gonna refer to the Ansible module for this, for the connection, and then what that would be, okay? Now, if it's, if it's not local, that would be, you know, if it's at a different domain or in a specific area, we would specify that, okay? So what we can, after you had set up your host INI, you're gonna go in and you're gonna edit it. So follow the step. And then every time that you edit it, you wanted to save quit, okay? Now, I want you to test it with the group name, right? Uh, so when you do step G, keep in mind that when you give it like local machine like this, it's not gonna like it because by default, all local machines are listed under the super group called all. And it's gonna tell you that it cannot find this. Or it's gonna say that, oh, this machine is already at a local machine um, and the local machine refers to all. So it's gonna give you some purple message. So at that point, you know that, you know, we would use a group name for a non-local system. Okay, so that's the whole point in that, in those steps is to show you that when you're using a local system, right? And you put a label on it, it's not gonna like it because by default, all is for the local system. Okay. Okay. Any question with this? Okay. So after we get through the inventory file, we would make a playbook. Okay. And if you have another machine to test with, like Raspberry Pi or another Linux machine, do this one. It's pretty cute. I don't know if you've ever seen CalSay on Linux. If you never seen CalSay, you should install CalSay. It's I, I do it for CyberCamp, and um, I show them, and it's really cute. It, it's it's ASCII art that you're gonna see. So what it's showing you here is after we created the the file, the host, the INI, we also need to create a playbook, and that is gonna be YAML. Okay. And in this part, you're welcome to use an IDE to write this file and, and be able to save it. But for the sake of using terminal only, because it most 
Linux server has only terminal. Um, I wanted to show you how you would do that. So again, you're going to do a super user do and you're going to VI editor, use the VI editor and you're going to put this playbook dot YML, which stands for YML in that folder where Ansible configuration file exists. Okay. And for any playbook, you need to start it with the three dashes like this. See the image? Okay. And with this, what will happen is it's going to say that, oh, that's a playbook. We save it as a playbook, but that's going to be the following will be the syntax or the, the, the code for playbook. And if you look at the link, there's a whole section about syntax for YAML. Um, so you saw earlier how, let me see if I can do. What did I call that playbook? I know. Okay, so we're gonna reopen that file. So this file exists here, right? And it needs to be together with this file. Okay, and it's in that subdirectory. So. Um, here, it also show you how if you need to go edit and such, you know, so when you create the playbook, make sure that it's together with the host INI and make sure that it is in the Ansible, in the Ansible directory. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the playbook. So what are we doing in the playbook? Okay, um, we are, we now remember this host right here. Okay, this VB right here, if it's throwing you error, it's because the host, remember, this is a group name. So if you have a group label or a group name that's clarified in the host, the INI, you saw that earlier, I had VB, then that's the name that you're going to use. Now, since we have local system, if you, if you don't put anything there, you can put all up here for line two, okay? Again, this is the group name that is specified in the inventory file. Whatever group name that you wanted to automate, which group, the group of the system that you want to automate, you're going to use that name here, okay? And so in this playbook, the first, the, the task that it's going to do is going to ping the system. Okay. And then it's going to do the installation of CalSay. Okay. So the name of this is going to be the, in, the install for CalSay. And since it's using the app module, you saw how we did, you know, apt install, apt update. It's using the APT module right? It's going to do the CalSay. Now, if you already have CalSay installed on the, on the Linux, right, you have to disable it, but this just initially just ping and then install CalSay. Okay, there are two tasks. Now, if you have more tasks, you can add more to it, and so you would start with the name. Now, what if I, I have a group, but I don't want I don't want all of the, 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 all of the computers in that group to have the impact of the task. Like I don't want to execute that task for every single system, right? You can also specify in the playbook where you would say host and then you would put the IP number and then you would put down what tasks you want for specific hosts, okay? It's supposed to streamline the process, not make it tedious. But usually what we do is we would set up the, the inventory 
file that would contain the group that we want to target, and then we execute the task for those for that group. Okay. So remember that there's indentation that's required. Okay. So once you have created this, this playbook, then you're going to execute this. But in this case now, remember, we're going to have an inventory file and we have a playbook. They go together. Okay. So when you do an Ansible playbook YAML and then Ansible host INI. Okay. So whatever the name of your inventory file, that's going to be the name that goes here. Whatever the, the name of your playbook, that's going to be here. Okay. And so that allows us to, so you would, you, if you type it like this, you will likely see some kind of message in purple saying that, you know, all, the all local hosts are under all and it's not able to run. Okay, so after you have that, then you can also edit your playbook. I added a couple of the screenshot for you. There were, you know, I stole this from people's playbook, sorry. <laughs> so that way you can see. So touch, if you are not familiar with touch command, right? Patrick probably knows, some of you use Linux probably know, or even in the Unix based system, touch is popular. So touch allows you to do what, create a new file in, in that, in a certain area. So here, what you can do is you can set up, right? All is for everything, including the local system. The task is to create an empty file. And when you do a touch, all that is, is gonna make a new empty file. And the file is gonna be named test underscore file dot text. So if you're unhappy with the cow say exercise, you can do this one for your playbook. You can do another one make another playbook for many files, right? What if I wanted to append to my file, right? You can, you can, uh, you can do echo to do an append. And echo works the same in Windows too. So all that is, is it's gonna append text. So after it creates a file or you can do a create file with append text, that's really up to you on how you want to do that. So. We don't have to open up the, you know, the editor and type in the file. It can automate some of that for us. And what string do you want it to append into the file? So you can play with it a little bit more to get your skills up, right? So here, and um, the path, notice the two difference, right? See how this path right here, it, we can set it up where it would be under the home directory and your text file. In the other one, remember in the in the lecture, it talks about how we can use the double curly brace, okay? And that, what we're doing is we're referencing a variable, okay? And keep in mind that item right here, it's gonna reference something to your, from, from, your module and also from your configuration file or your inventory file. Okay, so when you play with, when you work on this playbook, keep in mind that, you know, you might have to think about how you're referencing that variable. Okay, so this one shows you how you can make a playbook that would have multiple text files. And we can make you know, many for many systems at the same time, okay? So why do we care about that? What if we wanted to put scripts on certain system for, you know, later maintenance reason? Um, you know, a file, a readme file for the user uh, when they run the applications, stuff like that, or a readme file for other administrators to look at, um, stuff like that, okay? So after you, you run your playbook, I like for you to give me a screenshot. And if you don't do all of them, that's fine. If you choose to do one over the other, that's okay, right? 
but I want you to know the process on how to do this in case you need to. Questions? So um, I like for if, if you submit individual captures, that's okay. But if you put it all in one document, then you can only upload it once. That, that will be helpful because in my grader system, what it does is I can preview it. Um, and so if you have one document, I can, I can look at it all at once. But if you do upload multiple, I just have to click through the multiple ones, okay? Um, I prefer not to get zip file unless it's a project because zip file would go up to the cloud and I have to download it. It doesn't let me preview zip file. So, um, you know, you don't have to zip it. It would just be too much of a, of a hassle for you too. Okay, question. So this one is not bad. Uh, I have a question. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I, I tried to kind of make a playbook.yml file, and it says my directory Etsy Ansible does not exist, but it is created because I just made the um, the host any file. So why would I get that error? Okay. If Etsy um, Ansible does not exist when I already made it, I made it because of the um, I made the hosting file. Does that make sense? Are you in it right now? Yeah. I uh, yes, I'm. Can you I'm share? on another. Laptop. I I can on another laptop. Uh, okay. Let me see if I. Can. Okay. Um. Well, that's okay. That's okay. You can uh, please take an image of it. So if you created it and and you're trying to go, you just made a host the ini file, and then are you using sudo vim to get in? I have to use nano because I don't have. Oh, nano. Okay, so the the issue is that it's not a because Ansible directory um, there is a read only directory to users. So I this is what I suggest is to have a, an elevated privilege account and use that account to make your playbook. Understand? I probably forgot to put the sudo again. So right. So do the pseudo yeah. one, and if it doesn't work, then you have to make a user account that's a super user. And you can use the interface to do that, or you can do just user add. I don't know how oh, yeah. familiar you are. I did use pseudo. OK, um, and what, what does it tell you? It's, a, it's uh, sorry, it it did, it, the same, it is the same error. I, I thought, because um, I know I, I I thought I made a user account, but it says on the rips that I do have admin privileges. So I'm I'm confused. So maybe to... maybe use Vim then. Maybe use editor where you can edit it directly instead of because nano is an external application uh, from terminal. So I don't okay. I don't know why it's doing that. But yesterday I tried to use nano and I try to save it to that. I got the same message. I know exactly what you're talking about. So when I when I call nano from terminal and start writing it in nano, um, and then when I try to save the file, um, it it the folder itself is a read only for all user account because it's supposed to be only for system, right? Um, now other suggestions that people have have mentioned is that to be able to link the folder like other directory to it uh, but you know and then change the permission i don't want to tweak the permission on that because that creates some security vulnerability for for the controller system so quick fix maybe use vim okay <laughs> okay and then unless Unless, let me tweak it a little bit. Uh, I'll, if I have time tonight, I will try to use Nano or other text editor and I'll let you know. Um, but on the Mac OS, it's a little bit more forgiven from what I've seen. There's some tutorial videos out there that uses Mac. Um, okay, so speaking of that, I linked uh, a LinkedIn Learning 
in in the lecture portion of, of the video. So let me go back to screen share and I'll show you. So if you wanted to dive a little bit deeper in this, okay, um, I'm pulling some resources from LinkedIn and there's a guy that did, um, let me get to my canvas real quick. I don't know, maybe I close it. Okay, so now if you go into, I put a LinkedIn thing. So I'm gonna move this homework in place till next week, okay? Because I know there, there has been a lot of stuff and you guys are all stressed out by the last lab. <laughs> but under lecture lab videos, okay, I will put together to today's video on there uh, that will include. On the bottom, um, I put a LinkedIn link and some additional tutorial um, for Ansible. So LinkedIn Learning link is right here. So if you click on it, um, you will find the course. Okay. And then I, I kind of, you know, check out some of the beginning of it. So you can see, and it talks about, it talks about like the host, how to use Ubuntu, and the presenter for this particular uh, course, he uses Mac OS. Okay, so if you're looking to get a little bit deeper, if you're using Mac OS, you can take a look at this. And it is a little lengthy, but it goes into some stuff for the cloud um, and also network appliances. So this is network appliance heavy, okay? Um, the other one, I, this one is for Red Hat, I think, if it will load, sorry. Um, my husband's teaching upstairs who are both on Zoom at the same time. So um, yeah, so this is a Red Hat certification training. So the presenter for this, she goes through how to set up only the playbook side on the Red Hat. As you already know that the, the um, configuration, the inventory file is pretty easy. Okay, so she, and this is about 18 minutes. So there are a lot of like, uh, if you want beginner tutorial, maybe I'll link this one too for you. There's some stuff that people put up that's popular. There's a lot of different stuff on Ansible. And sometimes they would also have practice with it. So you can also write your host INI file and playbook all together when watching the video. Okay, question. Okay. And then um, as promised, let me. Let me give you the California Mayor's Cup. And in the announcement, there's also a link for it um, if you're interested. But we have Paul Marino Valley, we have Michelle and two other students that are competing. So if you wanna cheer them on. And I ordered the sweatshirt for the team. Uh, they call me and it says Friday uh, is the earliest that they can get it done. So hopefully if you wanted to pick it up, um, One second. So if you wanted to watch the live after five, okay. Um, you can register here after 5 p.m. every day. They have some kind of people presenting all kinds of different colleges and companies and professionals. Um, Brian Baker is my former student. He's gonna present after me on Thursday and I will present at 5 p.m. on Thursday. Um, if you wanted to register, I think it might be closed now, but oh, 
Oh, I guess it's still open. Okay, that would be the registration. Okay, any questions? And then um, if you didn't get earlier and if you wanted to be a book bounty, here's the competition. Sorry for the lengthy URL. That one is for the supply chain one. That's a good one to go for and winner gets 2,500. I know Facebook and other companies does it yearly. So if you wanted to compete for those company, possibly get the jobs with it, then that's good. All right, type in your name. Miss Lane already did that. Um, that's it for me today. I will stick around for a few more minutes if you have any questions. And yeah, I got it, Kevin, thank you. And then have a wonderful afternoon. I'm available on email and, and office hours if you have any questions. Have fun. Thank you for all the links and help. Yeah, Thanks. no problem. Okay. Sorry, I, I know I screw that up all the time. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye, Bye, Seth. I'm going to ask a question. Okay. So for the lab three, uh, when I was in network automation in the GNS3 lab, there was no NCC client module. You have to install it. Um, it's where we, so when you, after no. you added it to the topology, click on the console that's going to take you to a Linux console. Okay, and then you have to, you have to do the, the installation through the terminal in that console. Uh, yeah, I know you put a, um, a link to the GitHub site for the NC client. Was mm -hmm. that? Uh, one second, let me see. Wonder yeah, it, it is to the P here. This is to the project, but it walks you through on how to install it. I'll drop it in the chat for you. So basically uh, on what they showed there on the site is that it, because the, um, the automated system is a Linux system, okay? And I, I believe it's it's set up as Ubuntu, like either Ubuntu server or something like that. So you can do the, the you know, Python setup install. It is a little tiny, but if you change the configuration, it's gonna, it's, the, the font gets a little bigger on that. So you have to do the install and then running the configuration with it. And it uses net comp. So um, I got as far as putting Kimu on it. And then uh, when I tested it, it, it like it failed <laughs> for the script because, you know, it, I guess I'm, it's not connecting or it's not stabilizing, but I nested three ways. So and people told me that when you nest it three ways, sometimes um, it can be a little bit challenging. So virtual machines are good tools, but sometimes it's not gonna be the best tools. So now you got that far, that's pretty impressive. I, uh, I was surprised, but I couldn't get the um, NX OS mm -hmm. to work. So I tried to use a router instead, but I guess it's not the same. Yeah, you know, because Cisco, they, they, I think they, this, that's how they make money. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I, I looked everywhere. Even when you watch the stuff for, for Ansible on LinkedIn, if you do, um, he uses viral too. Like you cannot get around with, with using Cisco product um, and not use viral. Um, but, you know, automating this doesn't have to mean a Cisco appliance. Okay. But for the NC client, NC clients was more geared for like, you know, network appliances. Um, and then even on Juniper, it, it, you have to run Kimu with it and it, it takes up a little bit more resources. So it's a little, it's harder to work with the OS API um, on some of this through simulation. Um, and I wish that it, you know, we have access to appliances to test it. It will be so much easier, so much easier. And so right. the Oh, just uh, when I clicked on the configuration for the router, it's the console types is telnet. So does that mean that you can't use SSH and that it's telnet only? Right, right. It's a different port. So if that type of router only uses telnet, that means it's older, right? Um, right. Then, then you just use telnet to get in, which you can, it's very similar to SSH. It's, oh, no, it wouldn't let less keys. I, I tried to use the network automation tool to tell that into the router, and it, mm -hmm. it just, the host is unreachable. And I oh, didn't know. Uh, you have to set up, did you set up the IP address for it? Well, they have the same IP address if you look in the, like the okay. summary in the okay. corner. Did you ping it? Yeah. Um, I can't ping. I can't ping from the network. I mentioned the router, but I, I guess the router, it's the same IP address, IP address, but the different ports. So I'm not really sure how that works. Okay. So the router it, the, and the, the, the automation system have the same IP. Yeah. Same IP address, but different port numbers. Oh yeah. Then that's not going to work because it sees it as the same system. Um, you can configure the router to have a different IP address, like the adjacent IP address in the same subnet. And then you can, you can, you should be able to telnet it. Um, and to, to enable, so first you, you can just do this. Like it, if you on GSN3, um, if you click on the router console, what you can do is you can start with doing like enable or EN. And then after that, you would do config T. And if it doesn't know config T, you can likely do no, set up. I did, I did do it. So okay. you see that if I um, make a static IP address, it will override the IP address that shows in that upper right corner in the GNS3. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, it will override it. Yes. Okay. But yes. After, after you input in IP address, Right, and then you would say like, let's say 192.168.0.3, for example, then, um, you know, after that you have to save and quit. It's still, it's gonna, it's gonna walk you through every step on the older router. It's gonna say, oh, input in the IP address. And then you input that in, and then it, it's gonna, at some, it's gonna tell you like, oh, do you wanna activate um, SNMP? And then it, if you say yes, then it's gonna, manage that with the simple network management protocol if you don't then usually you don't need to for one device so you will put no and then it's going to tell you to save or not and if you tell it that's going to save it's going to save it to that router and it's going to bring you back to whatever host name that you gave it or the default host name and then what you can do is you 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 can check like you can do show config and it would show all the, the new configuration that you, you put in. So they cannot share the same IP. That will be a problem because right now, like in that simulated environment, it sees it as one and it will right. not be able to port it as one. So if you set it up as two separate system, what that will do is gonna tie the port and the service to a separate IP address. So, um... It's it you made it you made it sound like the if I change the IP address on the router, there will be a default of that prompt from SNMP. 
And when I did I did change, well, when I did configure the IP address to the same IP address as the network automation, I didn't get any kind of prompt. It just oh. accepted it. Any well, prompt. It, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always, it depends on the version of the router that you're using. Right. Some, some iOS have like additional. So if that router has additional services and feature, it will prompt you. But if it doesn't, it's going to not show you that step. So if yeah, you, it's probably it, Right. It's probably the 3725, which is like okay. five or more years old. Yeah. So. so that means that it's still it's able to use Telnet, but it doesn't have because some routers doesn't have SNMP and some routers have Telnet and some routers have SSH. Right. It depends on that's the problem with Cisco old iOS is that it doesn't. And even some of their appliances, even the same OS, it doesn't have. It's like, you know, you, you have different type of computers. There's some computers that have more RAM than others. And so, um, yeah, so what I suggest is to reconfigure the IP, but keep it in the same subnet. You can you can keep the same subnet mask on it. So think of it like a, a, a terminal that's attached to that, that yeah, router I'm, physically. I mean, uh -huh. it, it's, um, it's like 255.255.0. So okay. that's fine. And then, um, so I don't have to add any like ACL lists to allow the network automation device into the router. Um, or is that, I don't I think. Stop? I don't think that you would need to if it doesn't support SSH or key-based um, authentication. Oh right, um, <laughs> right. Yeah. But 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 look at the when when it finished, it gives you the summary of the configuration. And then I would suggest looking at Cisco documentation to see if you can look at that, if there are any kind of security feature that will block it. I don't think so. Because if you can tell net, if, it, if you enable Telnet on it, but make sure that Telnet is supported and enable on it, then they should be able to Telnet each other. I've used okay. Telnet in physical network for my classes before. Um, yeah, it's a super simple process. Okay, because when I'm on the network automation tool, I do Telnet, and then I get a prompt open, mm -hmm. and I get to put in like the either the IP address or the host name. Right, um, that's it. It's command line. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can't remember why it didn't work. Well, uh, if it's not connecting, then if it's timing out, Right, it's like so. First, I would suggest you pinging from the automated system to the router. If it's responding, then you can start telnetting. But 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 make sure the only thing that I I could think of that the router is not responding is IP conflict issues, like subnet mask issue. Uh, like if you put it on a separate subnet, that might not work. Um, and then additionally, if if that protocol or that port is disabled on the router then it's going to stop because a lot of the appliance, they disable the telnet by default. So you have, if you wanted to telnet into it, if it's there, then you have to go in and change the configuration to enabled. Um, and then after that, you should be able to connect to it. Okay. So there might be a few steps prior and you very close in establishing a simulated network, but, um, you know, I would test it. If you can't use the NX API stuff, you can you can maybe run like a, a PXFact or a Paramico with it and, and it's still gonna automate somewhat. Um, or you can even use, if it support Python, which, you know, think of, like you can look up that model to see if it's able to work with Ansible. And Ansible basically you just use it on a controller system. So if you wanted to install Ansible, you would install it on the, the network automated computer, that, that Linux system, and then launch it. So you already you already have it set up. You can add more to it. But now when you add to it, you know, it expands the RAM usage for that the GNS VM machine every single time. I, I think I had a problem on the network automation mm -hmm. device. I can't import anything. Is, um, is there, uh, I can't remember if you gave us um, a documentation on a network automation device. I did, I but for the import, are you trying to import into like using Linux shell? 
No, just use the just trying to import the NCC client module. Okay. And so I think I would I had a so command to be able to do that. Right. So if it gives you the command line, which it does, you need to install it first. Okay. I, I don't think the, the command is not there to install it, is what I'm saying. Okay. Like if I did help and I look at all the commands in the network automation device, there's no command to like install something. Okay, let me see. Uh, that would be the network automation. Installation. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Here it is. Um, pip install NC client. Mm -hmm. It says could not find version that satisfies the requirement. Right. So you have to do NC client version number. Okay. Yeah. So look at the documentation to see what version they're at. Uh, let me see. I, did I close it? NC client. For the py pi uh, two point oh no I'm looking at the wrong thing. Let's see zero point six point ten. Okay, and then um when I did I did the scripts that you should put in the homework, uh -huh. and I you know I I ran it, and it did it for the for the script the print conf. F it mm -hmm. report you 22 it said syntax error invalid syntax yeah because the 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 nx api is a little bit different than the appliance that you're using you're using ios so cisco has different api for different appliances so oh, okay yeah so you're asking for a command that doesn't exist on the router that you're using Got it, um, got it. Yeah. Okay. So when we write these scripts, that's just to call commands. Those that's basically what we're doing. We're using a script to call commands or respond okay. to commands. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I, I'm glad I clarify everything. And you know, I and it's good that you keep working on it because you can go far with it. So good for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Have a good afternoon. Bye, Michelle. You too.